also this week uh, saw the publication of an interview with WikiLeaks editor-in-chief uh, Kristen Hafrinson, who was, uh, and the interview was published by the Reykjavik Grapevine, which is an English language Icelandic magazine. Um, the interview is very long, but states in part that uh, Kristen felt that journalism had to be ethical, but tough. And he told uh, the Reykjavik Grapevine that, quote, the ideals that he followed at the time would probably be considered radical today. The accusation that journalism should be neutral in some way was a bit absent at the time. Being a journalist in Iceland for 20 years, he's gotten ac accusations of bias from all sides. And as he was telling a friend the other day, when you've had people shouting at you from all corners of the political spectrum, then you're probably doing your job right. Um, the article also says that WikiLeaks appealed to Kristen's journalistic sensibilities. Quote, this was something that was adding to the transparency, he says. Uh, it was legally difficult to stop. On that basis, I sought out Julian Assange. He was invited to Iceland in the autumn of 2009. We met, befriended, and that led to my involvement. Um, he goes on to say, uh, quote, in journalism, WikiLeaks did two things. First, it showed the power of huge leaks of this nature and that you can really move things by exposing many aspects of corruption and war crimes. Second, we pulled together resources of the mainstream media. We demanded that people work together, which was often difficult. The organization created a media alliance with hundreds of outlets around the world. It laid the groundwork for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, or ICIJ, cooperation on the Panama Papers, uh, Panama Papers, for example. This also inspired other whistleblowers. Edward Snowden has confirmed that it, if it hadn't been for those leaks in 2010, there would not have been Snowden leaks later on. And this work, though, has not been without criticism. And again, this is from the article uh, published by the Reykjavik Grapevine, uh, neither about WikiLeaks or its founder, Julian Assange. One of the most prominent uh, criticisms about WikiLeaks is that they dump files without making any redactions. There is no filter to the information WikiLeaks might post, prompting the, what Kristen has described as counterspin, most prevalent after the collateral murder leak, that the release of unfiltered information could put innocent lives at risk. Kristen is not, isn't having it saying, quote, it was quite extraordinary to see the Joint Chief of Staff on television almost in tears over the supposed dangers, saying that WikiLeaks could already have blood on their hands for releasing this information. But this hasn't materialized. Information is never neutral. It can have adverse effects to some degree, but every journalist knows that. But to this day, there has not been a single incident from this biggest leak in military history exposing all these internal secrets of the most powerful military machine in the world. No harm has befallen anyone. No one has lost their lives. I'm pretty sure we would have heard about it if that would have happened. This was confirmed during Chelsea, Manning's, Chelsea Manning's trial in, uh, of, 20, uh, of 2013 by the Pentagon officials. The leak had not caused harm. Ultimately. The ethos of WikiLeaks is fairly simple. Everything should be in the public domain, sensitive, uh, except sensitive personal information. Transparency should be the norm and exceptions from transparency should be very few and must be justified, Kristen explains. All freedom of information laws are based on that principle, but for some reason it doesn't seep in. We're still fighting this endless war against secrecy. And what people are missing about this story is the core principle here, Kristen says, that journalists are supposed to publish materials on politicians and especially candidates prior to election. That's the role of journalists. That's why it's called the fourth estate. It's totally amazing that even journalists are telling me, quote, you shouldn't have published the emails before the election, referring to the DNC and Podesta emails. And he says, are we not supposed to inform the electorate about the candidates? Isn't that our job? If you have internal information about a candidate or a party, it's your duty. It would be journalistic crime to withhold it. Then I heard, quote, you should have waited until you had something on Trump so you could be balanced. But it doesn't work that way. The DNC emails had information that was newsworthy, and definitely it should have been published prior to the election, and that's the end of it. It doesn't really matter where it came from. It's not the concern of the journalist to disregard information because it comes from some source that might have an agenda. Uh, you always have to evaluate information that is in front of you. It is in the public interest. To, is it in the public interest to publish it? It's a no-brainer. Either it is or it isn't. And uh, uh, turning to the, uh, Roger Stone's indictment, Kristen said to the uh, again to the Reykjavik great grapevine, "Quote: If you read through Stone's indictment, and it's only 23 pages long, it's basically a confirmation that." there was no communication between Roger Stone and Julian Assange, Kristen says. Stone claimed that there had been. He was trying to elevate his position. 
He's a player in that circle. It's Roger Stone. In fact, Kristen says, quote, the only communications that arguably took place between them was a direct message on Twitter in January 2017 where WikiLeaks asked Roger Stone to please stop making the claims that you had access to Julian Assange and had communicated with him because it didn't exist. With regards to the Cohen testimony, Kristen points out that WikiLeaks isn't mentioned on, is, is mentioned only once when Cohen said that he was present when Roger Stone called Trump and that he had just talked to Julian Assange. So what's the proof? that Trump knew Stone had talked to Julian Assange and therefore there's a direct connection. It's a claim. You're going to take at face value something Roger Stone is saying at the same time that you're charging him with lying to investigators. And Kristen continues in the article saying there's a silencing epidemic going on that is part of what I'm referencing to as near McCarthyism, he says. The war on journalism will probably escalate somewhat further. I don't really expect the mainstream journalism community to see the danger that is looming and why it is absolutely necessary to wake up now and support Julian Assange, WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning. Things will probably get worse before they get better, but I have to try to be an optimist. It did take some years for the mainstream media to come to terms with the fact that we have been lied to about the reasons for the invasion of Iraq. And Kristen pointed out that famed journalist and personal friend John Pilger had pointed out that all the major stories about abuse of power, the after effects of the bombing of Hiroshima, the My Lai massacre, the crack and CIA connection, were all broken by smaller, more independent media outlets indicating that smaller journals, journals perhaps reflect a sort of light at the end of the tunnel. That said, with so many sources to choose from, how are readers supposed to know who to trust? Uh, and Kristen says, quote, people will simply have to be more critical. They will have to learn to trust certain news outlets, never fully though. But you should read news outlets with a critical mind. Take into account the influence that might be behind the reporting. Do you trust BBC when it's reporting on the British intelligence community? Do you trust Russia Today when they're reporting on Putin? Do you trust Al Jazeera when they're reporting on Qatar? You should take everything with a grain of salt and learn how to put together a somewhat unsorted picture of what is going on in the world. But you should also demand proof and say, show me the documents, demand the evidence, demand transparency. And that was the end of the uh, quotations from the Reykjavik Grapevines article and their interview with Kristen Hafferson, the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm.